everyone, welcome back to this introduction to cultural anthropology. In this unit of the course, we're going to talk about anthropological approaches to race and class, and specifically we'll be looking at examples and conversations mostly based in the United States, drawing on two readings assigned for this unit. The first is an ethnography entitled Shapeshifters, Black Girls and the Choreography Citizenship. It's written by anthropologist Amy Meredith Cox, and it was published in 2015. The book is based on research that Cox conducted in Detroit in a youth center, where she was also involved as an educator a volunteer and later the director of the center. The second book we're reading in this unit is an ethnography entitled Privilege, the Making of an Adolescent Elite by sociologist Shamus Khan and it, this was published in 2010. And the ethnography is set in a New England boarding school where Khan uh, himself was an alumnus and where he returned to teach to research his book. So we're going to start with Shapeshifters by Amy Meredith Cox. As part of this research, Cox worked for eight years in a homeless shelter in Detroit, Michigan, in the United States. The shelter is called Fresh Start. In fact, this is a pseudonym, a name that Cox assigned to the shelter to protect her interlocutor's identities. Fresh Start is a temporary residence for young women between the ages of 15 and 22, women who are experiencing homelessness, and the aim was to help them transition to independent living, obtain uh, high school degrees, and start off on a career path. So typical residents of Fresh Starts are black or African-American women around 19 to 21 years old is the average age at the time that Cox worked there. And many of these young women were parents to a young child. Many had dropped out of high school, had left their homes. And many of these young women had worked in the service industry. They were, they were looking to earn professional degrees specifically like a healthcare or a similar professional certificate, find an apartment of their own, get a stable job, and then reconnect with the family members. And so through this ethnographic study, Cox wanted to critique what she had identified as a dominant narrative in the United States. And this was one, according to Cox, that positions black women, and particularly poorer black women, as either victims of structural discrimination or alternatively as free agents expected to undertake projects of self-improvement. And when they fail, it is because of some underlying cultural fault, or so goes the narrative that Cox is writing against. And Cox, through this book, urges us to move away from this dichotomy, the dichotomy uh, between black lives that are always at risk on one hand and narratives of personal failures to thrive on the other. In fact, she says, through this ethnographic research, real lives like the lives of her interlocutors in Detroit do not exactly fit either of these paradigms. Amy Cox proposed a different approach which was also driving her research question and methodology. And she argues that this research foregrounds instead people's ability to experience a creatively self-determined life as a basic human right and entitlement. And here I'm, I'm quoting from her writing. So I would like you to pause here for a second and to reflect on this and to uh, another quote that I will read shortly. What is an entitlement in Cox's use of the term here and how do you normally use the word entitlement? And then Cox also writes, individuals positioned on the losing end of power differentials rooted in age, gender, sexual identity, social status, access to financial capital, city of residence, shift the terms through which they are categorized as worthy and unworthy, through their own definitions of family, care, love, success, and labor. And I would like you to pause again on this sentence, which I think is really central to the argument of the book and of the chapter that you will be reading for this unit. But what does it mean? And notice that the title of the book is Shapeshifters, and what do you think the word suggests about the young women that Cox researched and wrote about? So on her first day as a volunteer at the Fresh Start Shelter, Amy Meredith Cox, who was then a graduate student, explained to the young women at the shelter that she was going to work there, but also write about their experience. And one of the women replied, Cox tells us in the book, you're black, just like us. Write what you want. We're going to want you to do more than write while you're here. And Cox writes about this moment, this conversation in the introduction of her book. And she's making a point about the mutual and intersubjective nature of anthropological research. 
her interlocutors had called attention to a shared racial identity despite their class disparities and had taken her to task to be a presence, a real presence in their lives and not merely a passive observer capitalizing on research data for her academic career. And Cox and many other anthropologists, it should be pretty clear by now at this point in the course, take these relationships of friendship, alliance, collaboration, and being mutually changed and interrelated and interdependent, not just as a side effect of ethnography, but in fact, one of its core methods. So Cox reflects in the introduction that although she too identifies as black, her class background, her privilege, educational history, in fact marked several power differentials that distinguish between her and her interlocutors at the shelter. She had this particular educational pedigree and background, the ability to present herself in a certain classed way, what we might call drawing from Pierre Bourdieu's work, social and cultural capital. She was not homeless, nor was she a young girl, she wasn't born and raised in Detroit, she wasn't one of the hourly paid uh, staff members, she wasn't a parent to a toddler, she was a PhD student, a program director, a middle class black woman. And this class differences, this intersectional approach was you know, really important to how Cox situated herself in the shelter and how she writes about it in the book. And in the book, Cox argues that social institutions like homeless shelters, social services, and schools often frame black girls as dysfunctional, particularly uh, poor black girls as dysfunctional in need of reform and improvement. And in doing so, she critiques these institutions often disregard women's own experiences, including their aspirations, their love, their desire, their work, and their care practices. And in fact, over and over again, the young women that Cox worked with encountered visible and invisible barriers and boundaries as they tried to support their families, get jobs, gain an education, and struggle. So Cox writes, um, as one of the kind of main conclusions of the book, black girls are not the problem. Their lives do not need sanitizing, normalizing, rectifying, or translating so that they can be deemed worthy of care and serious consideration. I ask that instead of a one-sided reading of black girls, we open ourselves up to a conversation with them with the full expectation that we will at least be changed. And in the chapter that you read for this unit, you're introduced to two characters, a young woman and then her grandmother in the family that uh, Cox calls the Browns. And the grandmother is this woman called Bessie Brown. She's this young woman, Janice's grandmother. And Bessie's story is that she moved from Atlanta to Detroit in the mid-1960s looking for a better future for her family in this bustling industrial city. Her brothers were talented jazz musicians and they also worked in the automotive uh, factories of Detroit. They had not finished high school but they got low-skilled jobs in the automotive factory and they did still much better financially than they did in Alabama. Uh, Bessie, on the other hand, uh, had worked as a house cook and maid for white Alabama families with her mother. And as she became a mother herself, she had to drop out of high school. And in Detroit, Bessie did the same work of housekeeping, but this time she worked in black middle class family homes. At the same time, she also got jobs waiting tables, cleaned up in bars and restaurants and clubs to make ends meet. With the period of deindustrialization and the closure of many of Detroit's automotive factories and the loss of thousands of jobs, Bessie really struggled. By then she was taking care of both her children and her elderly mother while also working two or three jobs at a time. And this is a, a kind of work that Janice, one of the main protagonists of Cox's ethnography, calls Struggly. And this is Janice's own theory of work and class and race. Being struggly, according to Janice, means working hard for no rewards. Her grandmother's jobs paid very low wages, uh, carried no benefits, and gained her very little respect or social eligibility outside of her low-income uh, black neighborhood and family. So Cox identifies a central paradox in the lives of women like Bessie. They held jobs as caretakers, often, to earn enough to support their families. However, they would have to do double shifts and take on multiple jobs at once, and then would have very little time of their own to spend as caretakers for their own families and children. And so this is what Janice meant by struggly in her words, or in Cox's uh, paraphrase of Janice's words, 
on page 56 of the book, doing difficult and distasteful things with no promise of rewards. It's about getting through, but not getting out. Now I would like to move on to Janice's own story as told through Cox's ethnography and how the story demonstrates Janice's own wrestling with this kind of struggling. Janice, in fact, had gotten into one of the best public high schools in town, but she felt she didn't quite fit with the other girls, who were mostly black middle-class students. So my next task for you is to consider this quote. This is Janice. She's talking about or recalling her high school experiences to Cox during an interview that Cox recorded and transcribed. I'll read it first and I'll ask you to uh, pause the video and analyze it and write down your thoughts and analysis. So this is Janice's voice. There was so much hype about it being the best school, but to me it was just a bunch of snobs. Every day you had girls looking at you all up and down to see what you got on and just spending their time talking about what boy was doing what. Every girl had a role or something and you get how I roll, I don't even care what my hair looks like, you know, I get it braided or whatever, but they were so caught up in all that crap. You had to, like, have a couch bag or Vuitton to go down certain hallways. I liked the classes, but the other stuff was a trip. The other girls were so bougie. I was into school, but couldn't take the other stuff. So what is Jess's critique of the school? What does it have to do with socioeconomic class and the intersection with race? And what does it have to do with the body? Can you create a, a connection between what we, we have learned in different units of this course, but the body, embodiment, and the habitus, perhaps, and this story of uh, Janice's high school experience? So eventually Janice quit school and joined a professionalizing program and she felt this was more suited to her needs and her aspiration and she really wanted to get into computer programming. But at this professional uh, program she was in fact directed away from computing tracks and tracked into service and clerical jobs. So again her gender, race and class intersected to reinscribe her into a, a new kind of exclusion right away from her preferred career path and into the career path that the counselors at the professional program thought she was uh, most suited for. However, Cox doesn't read Janice's experience in this period as, as a failure. And she argues that in fact, Janice determined the best course of action with the information that she had available at the time. She acted on the basis of her experience of what she already knew. And in the absence of models in her family of other women who suffered through class discrimination in school to try and get a better job, she decided to find a different path for herself. And there is a politics there, uh, Cox reminds us. It's not that Janice avoided uh, educational institutions or that she gave up on herself. Instead, uh, Cox argues, she constantly demanded that these institutions in fact live up to their stated mission, the mission of providing services for her, rather than simply changing and managing her body, her desires, and her behavior. So again, I would like you to think back to Pierre Bourdieu's theory of the habitus, the structured structures, structuring structures, and the complex interplay between social, cultural, and economic forms of capital. I'd like to return for a second to how Amy Meredith Cox uses the concept of entitlement in this work. Entitlement broadly is the belief that someone is deserving of rights, privileges, or a special treatment, depending on how you use the word. And in common use in the United States, this, this is a term that often carries quite a negative connotation, like demanding something is not quite earned. So uh, an elite critic of entitlement means taking their privilege for granted, uh, taking resources that others don't have for granted, being entitled. And a critique of entitlement directed towards poorer people means getting support and a special treatment without doing the, their part, without pulling your weight. But entitlement is simply a legal term for services provided by law to members of a society. Things like food support, social security, uh, unemployment support, veteran compensation, and so forth. And Janice and the other young women at the shelter where Cox conducted her ethnography believed fundamentally that everyone was worthy of the citizenship rights and had to be able to direct and determine the course of their lives. And Cox theorizes this belief as shape-shifting, the title of the book. 
and this is according to Cox, is an embodied practice and theory through which people shift the terms through which they're valued and devalued. It's a politics of the body that rewrites the socially constructed meanings ascribed to one's body and identity. And this seems a little abstract, so I'll ask you to pause and make sure that you get what Cox is telling us here. What does it mean to shift the terms through which you are valued and devalued, particularly through ways that are embodied and that are ascribed to one's body and also identity? So I mentioned the word intersectionality or intersectional a few times now, and I think it's important to unpack it. In 1989, a legal scholar called Kimberly Crenshaw came up with a theory that she called intersectionality, and it didn't really raise much attention at the time, and it picked up uh, later on. The point was pretty simple, was that people's multiple identities intersect in ways that impact how they're viewed, understood, and treated by others. So for example, uh, black women are both black and women, but because they are black women, at the intersection of two different axes of identity, they endure specific forms of discrimination that black men or white women might not. Okay, so this is the, the definition of this term that is used uh, pretty commonly these days. Obviously, underlying Amy Meredith Cox ethnography, Shapeshifters, is a broad exploration and analysis of race, and particularly about how race works in the United States. Race, as we've talked about in this class and beyond, is a grouping, is a kind of categorization of humans. In other words, is a way of creating distinctions between people. And race distinctions are particular because they're based on physical and social qualities that are presumed to be shared amongst human groups and presumed to be somewhat essential. So racial and racist thinking historically has been essentialist, meaning that physical characteristics that constitute race groups also are believed to correspond to other essential characteristics, both cultural and historical. And racial and racist thinking is always hierarchical, right? Generating discrimination, exclusion, and violence, and the historical processes of enslavement. But race was a social mechanism that colonial powers and settlers invented in the 18th century to describe and control various social, cultural, linguistic, and ethnic groups in a time of colonial conquest, expansion, and enslavement. And this 18th century concept of race, and I'm really generalizing here, but was modeled on an older Christian concept of the grand chain of being. And this is a concept that in turn medieval Christians had borrowed from Greek philosophers, and it was a hierarchy of organisms established by God or by nature, depending on what kind of thinker you were. And in the 18th century, this grand chain of being had incorporated humans and in fact subdivided different kinds of humans or human races posed in a clear hierarchical ladder. So remember, in the first unit of this course, we talked about late 19th century anthropologists. They had a theory of the three stages of society in which you could map human groups existing at different points in time. And I would like you also to think back to the 33 sculptures of the ethnographic faces, the human races wrapped around the Library of Congress in DC as embodying this kind of thinking. So race was a new mode of classifying people, and specifically people in colonial situations. It rationalized European colonial conquest, enslavement, and settler colonialism. Inequality in rank and status then appeared natural or God-given. But by the 19th century, these racial categories were associated with personality traits as well as broader ideas about civilization and history. And European and American thinkers associated, of course, the best personality traits with, surprise, their own races and inscribed uh, inferior ones to, surprise, other people in a hierarchy. North American theories of race were pretty compelling in the 20th century and they profoundly influenced and shaped the rise of uh, Nazism and racist ideology and genocide in Europe and in other contexts. And remember, again, back to the first and second unit of this course, Many anthropologists like Franz Boas, although trained in the racist paradigms of the 19th century, ended up devoting their careers to critique scientific racism. And in doing so, we should also remember that the work of Boas and his colleagues 
still relied on their privileged white American subjects and often exploited and marginalized indigenous people and their own ethnographic interlocutors by collecting, for example, religious and cultural artifacts and even displaying indigenous people as live displays. And there is more of a story there, but we're not going to get into it uh, right now. The broad point is race, this invented category, is very real, has very real effects, and is always embedded in relationships of power, hierarchies and exclusion, carrying the historical legacies of racism, colonialism, forced enslavement and segregation to these days. But race uh, as a category of self-identification has also become a powerful ground for cultural creation, for self-identity, for alliance, and for struggles for liberation, equality, and rights. Okay, so this was a lot, but now I want to transition and talk about the intersection of race and class. And we will do that through sociologist Shamus Khan's ethnographic study of this elite boarding school in New England. And some of you might have studied in a place like that. And this is where Khan went to school as well. And he returned there uh, for several years as a teacher while conducting ethnographic research of the school. And in his time there, Khan wanted to know how the teenagers at the school learned to be elites. His point was people aren't just born in a certain kind of class position, but class is acquired, is performed, and it comes to shape people's way of thinking about the world and the possibilities that they envision for themselves. One of his research findings was that the kids at the school learned to naturalize and hide class hierarchies, particularly through a cultural discourse, a shared cultural discourse based on the notion of hard work. Before we go further into this, I want to remind you uh, of the, the concept of class. And this is maybe the briefest and most incomplete explanation of the concept of class I have ever attempted. So please forgive me if this is too simple and uh, just very superficial. In the 19th century German intellectual Karl Marx's definition of class was that of a social relationship. So here's our starting point. We think of class as a social relationship. And classes are groups of people who have different relationships to a mode of production. A mode of production is how you produce a certain kind of thing. And Marx's research and writing mostly focus on conflicts and tensions between classes. So you have the owners of a factory, of land and capital, and then you have the workers. A middle class is all that is in the middle. And this is a, a structured set of relationships and it's independent from how people see themselves. Now, in contemporary use, we talk about class as a group of people sharing similar economic circumstances. And there is much more to this, but let's leave it at that for now. Okay, so back to the prep school. In his ethnography, Shamus Khan described the symbolic landscape of the boarding school with its laws and chapels and dormitories and classrooms where class, socioeconomic class, was embodied in the very physical built environment and in how students gave meaning to it. So there were places like the school chapel where everyone had a labeled seat and students progressed to higher seats as they became more senior until they graduated and moved out. There was a special couch where only seniors were allowed to sit and this was an unspoken norm or a convention. There was a carpet, there was like a large rug where only seniors could stand, another kind of unspoken norm of the school. And students often talked about the satisfaction that they got from finally being able to sit on this senior couch and how hard they had worked to get there. Now, in fact, despite all of this conversation about hard work, everyone at the school succeeded. Everyone advanced to be a senior and to graduate, and then they were off into an Ivy League school or a very good liberal arts college or a very good research university. So there was this hierarchy and students learned their place in the hierarchy, but they also learned that they could and would advance the ladder and climb the hierarchy. And students talked about their hard work, the thing that earned them success. And in the context of the school, you often, you always had to talk about how hard you work and act as if you were working all the time, even when you're not. And students who displayed inherited knowledge about the school, knowledge that they acquired maybe from their older siblings or from their parents, were in fact 
and, and who tried to sidestep some of these uh, implicit norms about who could progress and who could acquire what kind of knowledge about the school, depending on like their, their rank and their year, were informally punished by other students for showing off, for showing off their entitlement, for being entitled. Over time, students learned to highlight their experiences and their work and what they did, and to underplay and hide and not talk about their inherited privilege, the kind of privilege and resources that they had from their birth families. So for example, people never talked about the fact that the parents would afford to send them to this expensive boarding school, or that the parents had uh, gone to the school themselves. Now, Khan is really interested in how the students then related to staff members, janitors, custodians, canteen staff, cooks and gardeners, as a particularly interesting uh, point of class tension. And students often talked about how much they loved the women who cleaned the rooms, or a specific canteen worker who gave them extra food and a special greetings. And in fact, the staff members performed, in, in essence, emotional labor for the students. They listened to students' dramas and dreams. They offered support and advice. And it wasn't a, re a reciprocal relationship. It was one way. Students knew nothing about the staff's life after work. They couldn't even name most of the custodian staff when Khan asked. And the majority of the staff, with the exception of the one or two that certain students had a particular relationship with were largely invisible and unnamed. And when Shomus Khan asked the students to reflect on how the staff's hard work didn't result in upper social mobility or class mobility, the students had a standard answer. And over and over again, they talked about things like the staff having different values and different priorities or having been born or facing unlucky circumstances or how you know, this was true in the past, and opportunities like this, opportunity to go to a school like this, and to experience this like class mobility through hard work didn't quite exist in the past when the staff members came of age. And this was like a constant kind of shared understandings amongst the students about th this question of disparate relationship between hard work and mobility. One, the staff mobility is stagnating at the same level, at the same pay scale, and the students presume to go off into the world and do great things. And another thing that Khan noticed was that um, upper class students tended to be the closest with the staff members. They were learning to do what elites uh, have to do well, right? Relating to those who occupy a lower space in the social ladder. But lower middle class and working class students uh, were awkward around staff and tended to ignore them. Partially, uh, Khan found out, is because they reminded them that they didn't quite belong in the boarding school themselves. And instead, they focused their social energies in socializing with other students and trying to build relationships upwards, building relationships with students and faculty who would help them advance their social ladder. And this was not something the students were consciously doing or, or, or talking about, but it was apparent through their practice and through some of the shared idioms that they used to discuss uh, this kind of questions. So the conclusion for Khan was that at the boarding school, students learned to occupy an upper class position. They learned that they could climb up the social ladder and that hard work would get them anywhere. They also learned to feel that they are chosen one and special and that faculty members at the school sacrifice everything for their own education, for the education of the students, for their mentoring and care, and faculty members were expected to give this selfless sacrifice. And the students learn that the world gives itself to you, and at the same time, they believe that this position, the position of being among this chosen few, was not something given to them, but something that they worked hard for. And at this point, it should be quite clear how this belief about self-worth in fact, hid uh, some of the broader structural constraints of socioeconomic class. So I'd like to go back to Crenshaw's work on intersectionality for a second. And of course, people can occupy multiple class positions at once uh, through your family, through your work, through your schooling. You could be perceived as having different class positions at the same time. And scholars today write about class not just as a kind of economic position or structure, but also as part of self-identity and experience. And the idea that different kinds of class positions can intersect at the same time is important. 
Now I'd like to introduce another anthropologist called Sherry Ortner and she has argued that in her work that um, Americans often displace notions of class on discourses about race, meaning they can talk about race quite explicitly and there is often also a class subtext going on at the same time even though people might not talk about it explicitly as much. It's implicit, it's a subtext, it's displaced over a different topic. And there's like two common ways in which people think about race and class. They're opposites and then Orton identifies them as just general ways that people think about these things. One is the idea that racial categories and ethnic categories give or deny people access to resources, right? But the resources are otherwise available. And the second is that the idea that and this is opposite, that in fact socioeconomic class is the main factor that determines people's lives. In fact, both things are true at the same time and the concept of intersectionality. But Ortner is going a little for, further and she's showing that these two positions, these two very common ways of thinking about race and class, in fact, share a common assumption. They presume that the notion of class is somehow distinct and independent from non-economic criteria for distinctions like race, ethnicity, gender and sex. And in fact, they are closely interrelated, but they're not often discussed as such. And it's true that in the United States, discourses of race have had much more cultural salience than conversations about class. Class is often talk talked about all the time, everywhere, but never always openly. So for example, uh, Ortner is really interested in how class is talked about in the context of high school, thinking about high school obsessions with cliques and social groups and categories and the hierarchies and the language of sexual virtue and shame. And Orter argues that this language often uh, hides uh, really a discourse about class positions and class hierarchies. So Ordner's um, argument, and I'm quoting from her writing, is that there is no class in America that is not always already racialized and ethnicized. Or to turn the point around, racial and ethnic categories are always already class categories. Do you agree with the, this argument? Or to what extent do you agree with this argument? And if yes, why? And if not, why not? And if you're interested in the subject, in the context of the United States more specifically, I have two excellent reading recommendations for you. And if you have some free time, I really urge you to go out there to the library and read at least part of those books. The first is a book entitled Blue Chip Black Race, Class and Status in the New Black Middle Class. And it's an ethnography of the black middle class in the United States, which has been not represented in my lecture today. And the other one is a book that is an ethnography of Latinx women in high school in California. And it's entitled Women Without Class, Girls, Race and Identity. So this is all for today. We've covered a lot and hopefully I've given you seeds to pursue these questions further by reading more or exploring them in the context of your own lived experience or in the other units of this course. This is all for today. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to talking to you very soon. Bye.